Family and friends, we are here today to celebrate the life of my father, the life of Cleveland Williams. Before we begin that celebration, I've asked that my sister, Cheryl, come and read the reading of his obituary for all those present so that you can have just a glimpse into the man that he was and the lineage that he has and leaves behind, if you would. On the morning of August 4th, 2024, Cleveland Woodrow Williams passed away peacefully at home in his bed with a house full of people he loved. Cleveland was 86 years old when he breathed his last breath. Among the last words he spoke was the heartfelt and repeated phrase, thank you God. Cleveland was born January 3rd, 1938 to Ingram Travis Williams and Gracie Adele Lee. He was a baby boy of seven siblings, Clifton, Leon, Milton, Lucille, Myra, and Martha. He is preceded in death by his son, Charles, and five of his brothers and sisters. Cleveland lived a full life of love and laughter, leaving behind his wife, Connie, six children, Carla, Cheryl, Cynthia, Colin, Clifton, and Caitlin, 16 grandchildren and 17 great-grandchildren. He was a veteran and an outdoors man. Serving as a weapons demonstrator for the Army's Caribbean Command, he traveled the world and survived, survived the jungle, but his life didn't truly begin until January of 1960, when he gave his heart to his friend and savior, Jesus Christ. God meant everything to Cleveland. During his 60 plus years of ministry in the Church of God, he built churches and fellowship halls, led revivals, and witnessed the miraculous hand of God heal, save, and deliver thousands of people. Before his retirement from ministry, he was referred to as one of the icons of the faith. An accolade he wasn't sure he deserved, but cherished for the rest of his life. Despite the physical hardships of his final years on earth, Cleveland could find joy and reason to be grateful in almost any circumstance. When he loved you, you knew it. When he said he'd pray for you, he meant it. And if he believed in you, you could do anything. To say he will be missed is truly an understatement. For his family and loved ones, Life here is more empty without him, but heaven is more amazing because he is there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, he was, he was a pretty awesome, awesome man, and that's not just because he was my father. But one thing you needed to know about him is that from the very beginning, he had decided he was not going to take part in a sad funeral. He said, if you're going to have a sad funeral, you might as well just park me outside. I don't want anything to do with it. He didn't want to be a part of a formal service in which people were given the opportunity to mourn over the loss of a loved one. No, he wanted a wake he wanted a celebration in which people gathered together not to talk about loss, not to grieve, not to cry, but to celebrate the life that he lived. So we here at Conway Tabernacle ask that you join with us as we begin that celebration to honor the man known as Cleveland Woodrow Williams, also known as Willie, also known as C.W., also known as Preacher. Yes, the man had a lot of titles and a lot of names, but he was a big presence everywhere he went. And with that in mind, I would like to begin this service by inviting my brother to come up here because we have a couple songs, or at least a song, that we feel is very, very relevant 
to this exact moment, this exact time, and celebration and honor of who he was. Well, if you should get to heaven before God calls me home, there's one thing I'd like for you to do. After you see Christ our Savior and all your loved ones see, won't you march around that throne one time for me? March around the throne where all the angels' feet have trod, for you'll be in the presence of an ever failing God. Sing a song to Zion and shout the victory. Yes, if you see Christ our Savior upon his great white throne, oh, what a happy day that's sure to be. With the saints all dressed in robes of white, praise God for victory. And please march around that throne one time for me. Yes, march around that throne where all the angels' feet have trod, for you'll be in the presence of a never-failing God. Sing a song as I and shout the victory and march around that throne one time for me. Why don't you march around that throne where all the angels' feet have trod, for you'll be in the presence of a never-failing God. Well, sing a song as I and shout the victory and march around that throne. March around that throne, march around that throne one time for me. It's relevant, it's pertinent, because I know that that man is doing just that. I know that legs that didn't want to get up and go are running everywhere right now. He's doing things that he used to look at me and go, man, you are an absolute monkey. <laughs> and now he realizes, that's why. Oh my goodness. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, now Jesus. And tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today. Show me the way one day at a time. The road is there for me where the soul of a man never dies. And I shall.
telling you, if you don't know what my father stood for, it was for Pentecostal fire, celebration of new life, It didn't matter your age. It didn't matter when you came to it. Your life did not truly begin until you knew who Jesus Christ actually was. That was the way he lived. That was the way he lived every day. Six days before my father would pass away, after hearing all of the doctors gather around him and give their diagnosis as to what he was struggling with, and how much time they believed he had left. Instead of panicking, instead of mourning, instead of getting resentful or angry, my father prayed. There, confined to that hospital bed, he said, Lord, I've always been honest about the Word of God, and you know I have planned to be with you someday. So if this is how it's going to go, if this is how it is to be, then I commend my children to you. Do not let them become part of this world and know that I have loved you as much as any man can. If I live, it will be a miracle. And if I die, a blessing. If I live, it will be a miracle. Well, if you know my father at all, then you know that a living miracle is exactly who he was. At around two and a half years old, he was diagnosed with polio so severely that his ankles touched his shoulder. It was so severely, in fact, that when the neighbors of Ingram and Gracie found out about it, they called the sheriff saying, Sheriff, you have to do something for this boy. It's not right what they're doing, keeping him in that house. So the sheriff did. He paid them a visit, along with an ultimatum that said if things didn't change and change soon, the sheriff would return to take that boy to the hospital and his father to jail. But you know... My father's parents were praying people, too. And when that sheriff returned to make good on his word, he found that boy completely healed. Walking around, playing like any other boy would do. And what did he do with this miracle? Well, he did exactly that. He lived life. But my father's version of life was just a little bit larger than normal life. By the age of eight, he was already his own businessman, selling boiled peanuts and shining shoes. And by the age of 10, he was making a full man's wage every week. What did he do? Of course, he supported his family. He did. Bought his mama a washing machine. Bought his sister some shoes. He did a lot more than I did at 10 years old. And then at 18, he joined the military. He was trained as a commando to survive in the jungles of Panama. After that, he became a premier competing marksman. But as my sister has said, It wasn't until he returned home that another miracle took place in his life. Because at 4.15 in the morning on January the 5th, 1960, after five hours of prayer with his father beside him, according to my dad, the Lord lifted the roof off of that house in where they were and came down and miraculously saved my father. That is a miracle. Anybody who believes salvation is not a miracle has not experienced it yet. That is a miracle. Of course, it wasn't enough for him just to be saved. No. It wasn't enough for him just to say, hey, I'm born again, right? 
No, my dad, after receiving salvation, said, I'm going to have to live up and become what my mama had always called me to be. Yes, I know our Kentucky family thinks they are the first one to give him the title of preacher and the nickname of it, but they weren't. For when my father was born and the midwife said, Gracie, it's a boy, she said, God has given me a preacher. She was the first to give him that name. He had to live up to it now. He had to. So in the 60 plus years of his active ministry, he saved souls, delivered people from countless things that they were struggling with and oppressed by. And as it says, watch the hand of God miraculously heal people. He would often come to other ministers and he was just dumbfounded by it. He would say, is God not doing this? In your services? They'd be like, no. God, God's not doing that. It didn't dawn on him until about halfway through that God was using him to do dynamic and miraculous things. Not because of who he was, but because he knew who God was. He knew who God was. It was important that he also knew that his family knew who God was. Yeah, of course, we were all preacher's kids. We were all members of the sounds of faith, as he called it. I felt like a lot of the time we were uh, the Celtic women, right? You know, it's a, it's a group, and they keep bringing people into it so that the organization never actually expires. That's what it was. As soon as one member was too old to keep going, we brought in a new member, and this is the new guy who's on the block going to sing for you tonight. There were a lot of times that we did just that. And to us, we were just following along Dad. Sure, we witnessed some of the amazing things, but we didn't understand them at the time. But you don't have to take my word for that. Because there are some here today, many Forgive me, there are many here today who can testify to the same thing. We have some of those sounds of faith in the room today, and I would like to give them an opportunity to talk about my father, beginning with his wife, my mother. Because if somebody's going to tell you about it, well, a preacher's wife will tell you about it. Many of you know the minister. I knew the man and um, very well. Um, he was a good man, good father, good provider, good friend. You could say all those things about him. But he once chased a woman down in the store because she was about the size of me and he wanted her to try on a coat he was buying for me for Christmas. <laughs> He stalked another woman because she had nice perfume on and he wanted to find out what she was wearing so he could buy that too. He was a good person. He was a good man. I kind of pushed him about that one and said, you were following a woman around in the store? So He cried when he watched The Patriot every time that little girl said, Daddy, I'll do anything, I'll say anything, just don't go. And and he'd go like this, and everybody would be looking at him, and he'd be crying. Every time he watched that scene, he cried. He played practical jokes. And you who were in the hardwood business with him know all about his practical jokes, and I'm not going there. You all know about that. Yeah. Um, New Year's Eve, he said, let's all go in our pajamas over to so-and-so's house. And... Um, tell her that we've got some news for her. She fainted when she fell on the porch, and so he never did that again. We were all in our pajamas, and it scared her so bad. Um, his daughter, Cheryl, had a Halloween party and didn't invite us. So he said, let's crash it. I said, okay. I said, what are you going to wear? He said, I'm going to wear my doctor's outfit. And I, we got in the car, and In uh, Florida, they had stationed ambulances around at the holiday time all around. And we passed one of them, and we were stopped at the stop sign. And I said, I dare you. He ran over to the ambulance, 
talk them into letting him get in. And they said, if we have a call, you have to go with us. He said, that's fine. They put a mask on him. They put gloves on him. And they lit up the lights and drove right up in her yard. And he jumped out and said, anybody call for a doctor? And I pulled up behind him and she says, oh, that's my dad. And we did. We went in and crashed. We ate the food. She asked us to stay. We said, no, we're leaving. <laughs> and we headed out. Um, I pulled a few pranks on him as well because I had to get him back. One of them was Night Blooming Jasmine. He had sinus problems and he, he couldn't, he had allergies. And he was laying in our bed and I was standing by the window. And a skunk had come up through our yard and he said, hmm, smell that Night Blooming Jasmine? I went, yeah, well, you can get a better whiff of it if you come over here by the window. And he came over to the window and he goes, <gasps> he goes, you are the meanest woman I've ever seen. <laughs> Boy, he got mad about that one. Then there was the time that we were, we lived in a very questionable neighborhood. And uh, they were having, selling drugs in the corner in that neighborhood. And they were sometimes firing guns. Well, he had enough of it. And my brother was living with us at the time, and he was on one side of the house, and my husband on the other side of the house. And they ran into the living room in their underwear with pistols. And they ran out to the corner and run them off the corner. And the next day, the uh, man who lived next door said to us, we are so glad you did that. He said, you know what they say about you? We're not coming back to that corner anymore with those two crazy white men in their underwear. <laughs> He just wanted to protect. He wanted to love. And he was good about that. And he did, he loved the practical jokes. He really did. Um, our friend Rick Rogers, his lifelong friend, was unsure of becoming a Christian because he didn't think he could have fun. And so he told me just recently, he said, he taught me that you can be a Christian and have a blast and have a lot of fun. And they did. They hunted, they fished, they did everything together. And it was, it was a lot of fun. They did buildings together. They did all kinds of stuff. He showed him that being a Christian was a good thing. And you could have a lot of fun. You know, he, he knew where the fun ended and where God wanted him to do something. And many times he would come home and he said to my brother there, he said, um, pack me up. I have to go to Florida. I have to pray for Micah. And I said, okay, I'll call my bus, my boss, and say, I'm gone, you know, we're going to Florida. And that's the way he was. It, was, um, it wasn't an easy position to be married to someone like that. And you ministers in the house, you wives, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You just go with the flow, whatever it was. And he went to Florida and prayed for Micah. And Micah's alive today, and I praise God for that. What I loved about him best was his hands. He had the softest hands. He was a carpenter, but he had the softest hands. And I, I loved to hold him, and little kids loved to hold him too. And, and he would walk down the church uh, hallways. Well, one little girl in particular, she says, I don't remember much about my childhood, but I remember him. He took me by the hand and said, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And another little girl would meet him at the back of the church, and she would spin around on his very shiny shoes. Spin around like that. And he'd look down, and he just grabbed her like <laughs> She just wanted attention, and he knew that. And I loved his hands. And we loved each other without reason to. We decided a long time ago not to celebrate any anniversaries, and we didn't. And we didn't use the words never or always. If I ever said, you're always doing blah, 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 and then I have to correct myself, well, you're not always doing blah, 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 but you're doing it a lot lately. <laughs> and that's, we just didn't do that. We had a great relationship. But we knew God. And we loved God most. And that's what made the relationship best, as we shared that same faith.
I think my brother wanted to say something. He was my friend. You know, you hear that term that people use this day and time about BFF, best friends forever. Well, if you're a Christian and you have a Christian best friend, it is a forever deal. Because when you leave here and you be with them there, you're still the best friends. You don't ever lose that. It's a wonderful thing. He had three brothers and three sisters. When the last of his brothers passed away, he looked at me. He said, uh, you have to take care of yourself. He said, you're the last brother I've got. And I said, well, I thank you for that. And I said, then you're saying, I'm your brother from another mother? <laughs> he grinned and he said, yes. We fished, we hunted gator, we golfed. I'm going to tell some fishing stories on him because that's what he did to me. He always said I had a water magnet in my body, and every time I got near the water, I'd fall in or something. It always happened. But we fished the St. Lucie Canal a lot, which runs into the Lake Okeechobee. And one night, about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, I nudged the boat up on the muddy sand there, and he was going to get out off the front of the boat and go get the trailer and back it down and put, put the boat on. And I had the flashlight holding it, and all of a sudden he just are off the front of the boat. I'm thinking, what are you doing? He stood up and dirt stuff on him. I said, why'd you dive off the boat? He said, I didn't dive. My feet got tangled in the rope and I fell off. I started laughing. He said, that's not funny. I almost broke my neck. <laughs> Same canal, gator hunting. I'm idling the boat up on this, what I thought was about an eight foot gator. He was on the front of the boat with this 22 rifle. And we got close enough, I hear a click. All of a sudden, he's scrambling backwards because the boat was still going toward the gator and the gator was still coming toward the boat. He says, back up, he's coming in the boat. <laughs> it's funny how when you think something's going to climb into the boat and eat you, it grows exponentially. Today, it's a 12-foot gator <laughs> when, you when you talk to him about it. He was a good golfer. I was not. I think that's one of the reasons he took me with him, to make him, make him look good. Uh, when I went golfing, I always said, you want to go flogging? And I'd say, oh, shut up. I get in the car, okay. You know, you, you meet a lot of people that say they love God, but I want to let you know he truly loved God. And he truly loved people. And I am blessed to have been one of those people he loved. My name is Cliff. That's my dad in the picture up there. Most of y'all know that. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with him. I've told several people. Uh, he was always my dad, and so to lose my, my dad hurts. But in the past few years, he had a lot of uh, physical hardship. And during that time, I got to spend a lot of time talking to him. And he became my buddy. He became my friend. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy for my friend right now, you know. And uh, I know that he's not thinking about me at all. He made that clear. <laughs> he said, I will love you to the end of the earth and back. But once I'm gone, I'm not going to think about you at all. I'm with Jesus. <laughs> and... Uh, through the process of talking with him, one day I just decided to uh, set up a recorder and just record some of our conversations and, and ask him about his life. And through the process of that, we wrote a book called Man of God, and uh, we filmed a little trailer for that book. He narrated it, and it was requested during this service that we present that trailer for you all. And it's not about the book. It's not about... Oh, look what we did. We filmed a thing. It's about sharing a little bit of the story about who he really was. 
Somebody lives that big. I call it the Christian Forrest Gump. Somebody lives that big. Sometimes it's like that movie Big Fish. Like you don't believe, you don't know what to believe. And then you start hearing stories from people who were there with him. And you're like, oh, snap. He really did these things. Or these things really happened. And so right now we're just going to show that little video real quick. And then I'll come back up here and bumble through a few more words and sing a song for you. You've got to push. I wasn't born in a hospital with a host of doctors and machines to pull me out of mama and usher me into the big blue world. Weren't no loved ones all teary eyed and excited to see me for the first time either. Nah. I was born in an old wooden house with just mama, a midwife, and an old hand-me-down four-poster bed to bear witness of my arrival. No one else was even in the room, not even my daddy. That's the way it was done back then back in good old 1938. Just breathe. Can you push again? Yes, honey, you can. Come on, honey, push. One more. One more. So you've already seen, Dad, what we'd filmed before. We're trying to finish the trailer, and what we're going to do is we're going to show scenes of the stuff we filmed before in the cabin and all that, and then... Uh, we're going to cut to our interview with you. So tell us about the first miracle that you ever, that ever happened in your life. Well, the first miracle, I was about two and a half years old. I was smitten with polio. I became crippled. My uh, left side was drawn down where my shoulder almost touched my ankles. And the sheriff came out and was going to arrest my father. My father said, give me more time. Uh, and I believe that God will heal my son. So the sheriff said, all right, we'll give you a day or two, something similar to that. And uh, God miraculously healed me from polio. That's the kind of stuff I'd sit and talk to my dad about for hours. And I still have about six hours of just talking with him over coffee until I wore him out to be like, uh, are we gonna do something else besides talk? I'm like, we can do whatever you want to do. But uh, there's been a lot of things said about my dad here at, at, today and, and yesterday. And, uh, for the most part, they're true. <laughs> I'm kidding. They're very much all true. Um, but he, he lived big. He loved big. And they've all said that. And, uh, but he loved God more than anything. That, I'm certain. You know, he... Uh, Right before he retired from the ministry, uh, he went down to see the general overseer. And, and I remember wheeling him in the, wheel, the general overseer's office, and he was in his wheelchair. And uh, he started showing me this notebook that he had of 60 years of ministry, and this journal of all these lives that have been touched and the buildings that have been built. And, and the overseer looked at him and was like, this is like Christian history right here. Like, this is like... Uh, like we should preserve this or something, and, and he's you're like a you're like an icon in the faith, and, and uh, the problem with my dad was he's a humble man, but that made him feel really good, and so we we're wheeling him out in the wheelchair, and everything was cool until he started talking about himself in the third person. He's saying things like, "Man, I think the icon might be hungry. <laughs> the icon might need a steak dinner." And I'd be like, the icon needs to find his wallet. <laughs> but uh, in the last, I've said this story several times. Maybe me saying it makes it easier. The last hours of my dad's life were, were beautiful, all things considered. He was surrounded by people he loved. I played this guitar for about four or five hours. Um, There's one point where he didn't want to hear any more guitar, I could tell. But I grabbed my guitar and I, I, I could see this 
look he had. And I was like, he's more patient with me than he is with some others. <laughs> but I could interpret that. And I said, is it okay if I play music real soft? And he goes, real soft. And I was like, all right. So I played a little bit, and he gave me the, the okay. And there are times when I thought he was asleep, and he wasn't. And struggling to breathe, it sounded like he was breathing underwater. Struggling to breathe. I could hear him say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And, uh, you know, if, if I can learn, and I'm trying, but if I can learn to love God half as much as that man, that's going to be huge. And so uh, if, you, if you don't know who God is, then you don't even really know who my dad was, really. It's, it's you know, it's something else. He loved the Lord with his whole heart. Everybody knew, everybody knew we were second compared to that. <laughs> you knew it. And uh, this was his favorite song that wasn't written... 30 some odd years ago <laughs> or longer or 50 years ago and uh, I forget how old I am and I started playing it at the church and when I would play it he would sit and cry when he would come to, when he was able to come to church regardless of what I had planned I had to put that song in the set because it didn't matter he's here we have to play his favorite song and I would play it there's one time in particular my uncle looked at me from over here and he said, you gonna play your dad's song? And I said, well, it's not really on a thing. He said, you don't know how many more times you can play that song for him. So I'll play this song for him the rest of my life. And uh, I hope y'all can sing along with me in this song and just know that it was it meant a lot to me that, that uh, he and I could share that. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Rejoice as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. Last when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes. 
It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the reeds. Yes, we're free, free, forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began. As I've said, you don't have to look very far to find someone who knows what my father lived for. You've seen a couple of the sounds of faith. You've heard some amazing stories. And hearing their stories, well, it promotes me and pushes me to tell one of my own. Because I remember one time when my brother and I were sitting with our father in a restaurant called Sweet Betty's. Now, for our family in Florida, you may not know about this restaurant, and that's okay. But what I can tell you about it is that it was a restaurant where you could find good food and good conversation, and my father loved both. But I remember one afternoon sitting there with him, and he decided he was going to regale us with one of his stories about evangelizing. And he went all the way back to the beginning. He said, you know, I used to be a meat cutter in Winn-Dixie. Both of you guys know that. He said, but what you might not know is that at one point, when I really felt called to evangelize, when I felt called to go out into the ministry, yeah, I had a great job. He said, but I was called to get an even greater job. And I'm like, okay, all right, Dad, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, calling is a calling. And he said, well, in order to do this calling, I felt I needed to be out there always. I couldn't come back in. I couldn't be tied down to a position. I had to live in the ministry. In order to do that, I was going to need a house trailer put along behind my vehicle so that I could just be there to help. He said, so I walked in to my supervisor, and I said, you know, I have $300 in Winn-Dixie stock, and I would like to sell it to you so that I can get a trailer to pull along behind my vehicle. And of course, his supervisor looked at him and he goes, are, are you sure you want to do that? You sure? I mean, that's company stock. It's not just like the piddly share stock. That's real stock. Says, we'll let you do that if you want, but I would advise against it. My father said, no, it's yours. $300 is what I paid for it. If you'll hand me $300, you can have it back. He bought a trailer and he evangelized. Now, immediately, my brother and I grabbed our carpenter's pencils and our napkins, and we started figuring. We were like, do you realize that that stock today would be worth in the millions? And as we were sitting there talking about all the good things and some of the selfish things we could have done with that money, I remember my father just laughing. And I said, Dad, this is not funny. This is so not funny. Imagine what you could have done for God with all that money. I learned recently why he was laughing. He was laughing because stocks could not be called upon to anoint a lady who had a useless leg. It had been unused for 12 years. And then watch as that lady danced in God's house using that leg. He laughed because he realized shareholders, coupons, and bonds would not be able to be called upon to anoint a staph-infected infant who was born with no pupils, 
an esophagus that was not attached, and a mass in her back that it looked like a third kidney. Michelle Hanlon was, is her name. It's Michelle Gates now. My father officiated her wedding, and yes, she too was complete healed. He laughed because there was not any amount of money that you could have paid him that was more precious than the souls he saw saved and the miracles that God did through him. I didn't realize it at the time. I thought, man, God can do so much with money. What God really wants to do is use you to change the world. I've said this in my ministry for a while now. If God can touch the heart of a person, their money ain't going to matter to them. They'll realize what's truly important, what God can do with you. But I digress. I don't want to wander off the reservation like some of us Pentecostal preachers do, right? Where there's a purpose. There's always a purpose. So returning to that day in the hospital, when my father said, if I live, it will be a miracle, and if I die, a blessing, although I know what he meant when he said it. I do not believe that he was praying for another miracle in his life. After all, as you've heard, his life was full of them. No, what I believe he was praying for, what I believe he was talking about was the same thing that Paul was talking about when he, being confined and bound in prison, wrote to the Philippians saying, I know that by life or by death, Christ will be magnified in this body. For, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. My father knew My father knew where life was and where miracles were in that life. My father knew a blessing that is death. And I'm telling you right now that God didn't just want my father to experience that. He didn't just want Paul to experience that. What you need to understand is he wanted you to experience that. He wants you to know what it's like to live in a miracle and to die in a blessing. Make no mistake, there is life past this life. When confronted by the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, Matthew says that Jesus corrected them saying, you do not know the word of God that you talk about and you certainly don't know the power of my Father in heaven. Have you not heard it read of my father that he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? My father is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. Now, I know that for some people, especially those Sadducees, that sounded like crazy talk. You know why? All of those men have been dead for a long time. But Christ wasn't referencing their physical bodies. He was referencing and regarding their spiritual identities. That's why the body is left when someone passes away. God does not care about what you are. He cares about who you are. He cares about who you are. He loves you. And that is that miracle. That is that blessing. So if you do not know, if you do not know, he who is capable of making your life a miracle, he who is capable of letting you experience a blessing after this life, there are many in here who can point you in the direction. It's our responsibility. It's our calling to continue the work that my father dedicated his life to. It's a ministry of letting people know that there is a miracle in life, and that is Jesus, and that there is a gain to be received, because I know that my father lived for Jesus. And I know that now he's receiving everything that God promised him. Everything. 
It's not one of those that you have to feel you have to preach the person into heaven. I guarantee you, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it justice. But as we draw this service to a close, I thank you for being with us. I thank you for the overwhelming support. And I would ask if you desire to, join with me as we pray a closure to this service. Not an ending of the fire, but just a beginning of its spreading. Lord, I thank you first and foremost for the grace and mercy that you so richly give us. I thank you for what you did in that man's life. I thank you for the privilege it was to know him. And Lord, I ask that you let that knowledge never fade from me. Let that impact never fade from those he came across. But Lord, let that fire that you placed within him spread to those who knew him. Let us remember the most important thing to him was you. Lord, minister to the hearts of those here. Yes, grant peace to those who are grieving, Lord, but help them to realize there is strength, there is gain, and there is blessing in the shadow of the Almighty. This I ask, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.